Good evening, everyone. I'm Georgia Davis, and welcome to AZ Illustrated Nature. The annual gem, mineral, and fossil showcase is underway in Tucson, and tonight you'll see some of the brilliant specimens and learn which ones you can find in Arizona. Also, when people talk about volcanoes, Arizona may not come to mind, but scientists say volcanic activity has played an important role in the state's geology. But first, here's a look at tonight's headlines. The Border Patrol's Tucson sector continued as the busiest on the Mexican border in the last federal fiscal year. Federal officials report about one-third of all Border Patrol apprehensions came in the Tucson sector, which covers most of the Arizona-Mexico line. Agents in the sector apprehended 121,000 people and seized more than one million pounds of marijuana. The Tucson sector numbers also included arrests of more than 10,000 minors last year, most of them unaccompanied. Campaign finance reports are in for the last quarter of 2013, and they show Southern Arizona congressional candidates raising large sums. Reports filed with the Federal Election Commission show in the Congressional District 1 race, incumbent Democrat Ann Kirkpatrick brought in $264,000, while Republican Andy Tobin collected more than $230,000 to top his fellow GOP candidates. In District 2, Martha McSally led Republicans with $313,000, while incumbent Democrat Ron Barber raised a quarter of a million. There's a third Republican candidate in that second congressional district race. Air Force veteran Chuck Wooten announced his candidacy today. Incumbent Democrat Ron Barber is unopposed so far. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Thousands of people from around the globe are in Tucson to visit what has been described as the largest treasure hunt in the world. More than three dozen shows make up the annual gem, mineral, and fossil showcase. Experts say it's a fitting yearly occurrence in our state since Arizona is one of the most diverse and complex geological areas on the planet. Next, you'll learn about some of the state's minerals in this excerpt from Under Arizona, a documentary from 8 Arizona PBS in Phoenix. The forces that form mountains and carve canyons also conspire to create geologic wonders at the molecular level. Minerals. Volcanoes, the magma coming up, when you start liquefying rock, you can start concentrating minerals. And as the magmas either reach to the surface or erupt or start cooling down, certain elements congregate together and start clumping together and, and can precipitate out. And there were a series of granites that came in and they brought a lot of copper in with them. And as those granites came in and started to solidify below big volcanoes, the fluids came off the granites and started to deposit in fractures and things like that. And so you get veins that have all these copper minerals in them like azurite, malachite, uh, chrysocolla, the blues, greens, turquoise colored minerals. One of the minerals that I like best is a, a green mineral called olivine, the gem variety of which is peridot. And the thing that's fun about olivine is it represents the Earth's mantle. So that you have the crust, and below the crust you have the mantle. And the mantle was made of olivine. And so it's really interesting to think that the Earth's inner parts are not red and glowing, they're green. It's amazing that, that you could find something that tiny that well preserved in something that was born out of these incredible forces, this maelstrom of continents colliding and mountains rising and all of that. A real variety of processes that are interacting there that allowed these things to be brought together and to be preserved. The Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium at the University of Arizona changes one of its exhibits every year to coincide with the annual GEM Mineral and Fossil Showcase. This year, the topic is Best of the Best, 
prize minerals from the vaults of Arizona's collectors. We are joined by two guests to talk about the exhibit and some of the alluring minerals you can see there. Mark Candy is the assistant curator for the UA Mineral Museum at Flandreau Science Center, and Evan Jones is a mineral collector and co-owner of some unique minerals. Thank you to both of you for coming in and bringing some incredible minerals that we'll talk about in just a minute. So let me go to you first, Mark, and, and tell me a little bit about this exhibit and what's the impetus behind it and what can people see? The impetus, impetus behind this was to convey to people what goes on in Arizona, showing off the collectors that are, are, live here, they reside here. A lot of them live in Tucson very specifically because this is kind of the center of the world as far as minerals go. Um, if anybody that lives in town is, realizes with the amount of traffic that we've got going on and the lack of reservations at restaurants, that the gem show is a big thing here. And uh, we just kind of wanted to take it a little bit further and show off the people that are here and convey their passion for collecting, get an idea of what motivates these people and you know, what they enjoy. Well, it's interesting, you said, so it's, it's not just about, it's not like minerals from Arizona, it's actually about the collectors in Arizona. The minerals that we're gonna be displaying are from all over the world. Uh, in the case of Evan, he is an Arizona collector. The pieces you see in front of us are all from Arizona. But each one of these people has a, a, a discipline or a passion. Some people collect certain sizes of minerals. Some people only collect certain chemistries of minerals. Some people love certain colors or shape or form. Uh, so it, it, it it's really amazing what goes on. You have everything from micromount collectors, the people that literally have to look through a microscope to see their collections, to people who collect large cabinet museum size pieces. And we're, we'll be showing that and conveying that and giving you an idea of how that passion starts. It's interesting that all the people that we're interviewing and talking to for the display, most of them started when they were six, seven, eight years old and have just kept that passion going, usually with parents you know, encouraging it and getting them into the sciences. But it's amazing how far you can take it, how much science is involved in the collecting. And the more knowledge you have of the minerals, the more that you, you appreciate them. You know, looking at these pieces, it's just incredible to see a copper specimen that has that large of crystals that are that form of crystals as well. All right, so Evan, let's go to you then. So what is your story? How did you get into collecting? Well, my father uh, started collecting minerals, uh, oh, in the, probably the 1930s. And uh, uh, since that time, he, he built up a pretty large collection. And so I was kind of born into, into this. Uh, he's a, a noted author and lecturer on the subject. Um, so I've been collecting since I was very young. Uh, these are some pieces from the collection. Um, they're obviously not micro mounds, right? right? So what what is your specific goal when you're collecting? Well, I started out collecting, and my father before me, uh, minerals from all over the world, uh, worldwide specimens. But since uh, oh, about 15 years ago, I've narrowed my focus to being born and raised in Arizona. I love minerals from Arizona, so I thought you know this would be a, a great way to focus my energies. Well, let's talk about some of these minerals. I mean, these are incredible, and I'm hoping that the camera captures them and all of their beauty because I'm, I'm stunned, frankly. Um, although, first tell me, what is the difference between a gem, a mineral, and a rock? And these are all minerals, right? Yeah, well, we call these mineral specimens. Uh, rocks are, are composed of minerals. Uh, you know, a rock is, would be something like limestone, slate, basalt. But each one of those is composed of tiny grains or crystals of, of minerals. Um, these just happen to be large crystals, or in this case, uh, stalactites of, of minerals. Uh, a gem is something, uh, it's a mineral that you take and cut and polish to be worn as jewelry. So, and these are known as gems. Okay. Um, well, so let's start on the end. This is a beautiful blue mm -hmm. specimen. Copper? Yeah, this is called azurite. Uh, azurite is a copper carbonate, and uh, it's mined as a copper ore, but it can also be cut into jewelry. And where does this come from, or where did this specimen in particular come from? This one is from Bisbee, Arizona. Uh, this was probably collected in about uh, probably the mid-1890s, something like that. This one's been around for a while. Uh, you know, Bisbee produced, back in those days, uh, a huge amount of copper 
uh, to fuel the Industrial Revolution. Um, the mining company at that time was also uh, very, uh, they actively promoted the preservation of their mineral specimens. Um, so this is a piece that was, has been preserved over time and it's been passed down through from collection to collection and eventually I acquired it. Wow. A lot of the owners and the miners were collectors and had the passion for it as well. So that's, that's conveyed and, and continued on. And these literally have a history. They have a provenance that you love to have along with the mineral as well. Yeah. Well, that's, that is a question I have for you, Mark. So you, when you get specimens like this, how often is there a provenance attached to them? Unfortunately, a lot of times it is lost, I mean, to time. Uh, some of these are recent pieces. Both your, your aquamarine piece that you're seeing there and the wolfenite piece are relatively new digs that have come out of the ground recently. Um, for instance, uh, the U of A Mineral Museum has just got a collection from the Princeton Mu uh, University. Um, they gave us 600 pounds of Arizona specimens, and a great number of them are from Bisbee that were collected in the 1880s, 1890s. Princeton was the, the center of the world as far as the teaching school for miners and mining engineers and geologists. So a lot of the minerals from Arizona went all the way back to Princeton and have now been repatriated here. Here they are. So, so the idea is to, to preserve the history of these things. Uh, when you acquire them, you want to write down all the information as to when you acquired it, uh, uh, where it's from, who you got it from, and that sort of thing. And, and so that can be preserved through time. So we only have about a minute and a half, so give me a quick synopsis. What are these other three minerals that I'm looking at? Uh, these are crystals of copper, uh, and this is from a place called the Ray Mine, which is uh, here in central Arizona. This was found uh, by a shovel operator mm -hmm. who worked at the mine in about 1974. This is an exceptional piece. Um, this is a cluster of aquamarine crystals, and this was found by uh, a, a a digger who, who likes to go out and find crystals uh, in the mountains and he, this is from uh, uh, a place called the Santa Teresa Mountains here in central Arizona. This is, is very unusual for, for Arizona. Aquamarine uh, is, is a rare thing for here. Uh, this is something that I collected myself. Uh, these are wolfenite crystals and uh, wolfenite is, is mined for lead and molybdenum. Uh, so this, this was a, a really happy day when I found this. So these are just some of the minerals that will be uh, on exhibit. Um, so how many minerals will people be able to see? We're going to be displaying probably about three to 350 different specimens. They're going to be everything from the micromounts. I mean, we'll have a microscope up so you can see these things. Two specimens. I've got one piece that's going to weigh about 35, 40 pounds that will be wow. on display. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in and for sharing these with us. You're welcome. Pleasure. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next News Hour. New online ventures attracting big names from traditional media. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. The music of Broken Bells is upbeat with a sometimes dark message. There's a little melancholy to it for sure. Life um, is sad. I think Brian and I sometimes <laughs> have pretty heavy conversations about things like that. And that would be Brian Burton, AKA super producer Danger Mouse and James Mercer of The Shins talking about performing together on the next morning edition from NPR News. Many of the landscapes and minerals in our state are here because of volcanoes. In northern Arizona, volcanic evidence is easy to find, especially around a well-known landmark near Flagstaff in Coconino County, which is home to the highest peak in our state. We take you there in this excerpt from Under Arizona, a documentary from 8 Arizona PBS in Phoenix. When we look at the strata on the Colorado Plateau, what we see are about 25 or 30 different named formations that started about 525 million years ago to about 80 million years ago. And during that long span of time, 
each one of those formations recorded a different environment. And there were times when the ocean inundated the Colorado Plateau, other times when tropical rivers coming from the Appalachian Mountains would flow down across the Colorado Plateau, and other times when there were vast deserts like the Sahara today, with dunes blowing out of the north and marching down to what is now the Phoenix and Tucson areas. About six million years ago, the vast flat landscape now known as the Colorado Plateau began to change. Lava spewed forth from under Arizona, forever changing the landscape. Today, more than 600 volcanoes dot an 1,800 square mile area, known as the San Francisco Volcanic Field. Anyone who walks the ground in northern Arizona is going to stumble on vast sheets of lava that once poured out across the landscape. You can see things like volcanic bombs, which look like footballs, and they rest on the surface of the earth. You can see these smaller pieces of volcanic rock called cinder or scoria, and they're littering the landscape. And the broken remnants of all these types of rocks can oftentimes be found when you're walking around here. San Francisco Mountain, also known as the San Francisco Peaks, is the largest volcano in northern Arizona and the highest point in all the state. The San Francisco peaks are a typical stratovolcano, the largest volcanoes on planet Earth, and their history starts about two million years ago when ash flows and lava flows would have started to accumulate around a vent, piling up to an elevation of 15,000 feet above sea level. And sometime after half a million years ago, the volcano either violently exploded its top or collapsed, and the San Francisco peaks lost 3,000 feet, about 15,300 feet above sea level. Today, it's 12,600 feet. The San Francisco peaks, known to Hopi as uh, Nevada Cuyovi, which means the snow-capped peaks, is one of the central uh, landscape um, elements to Hopi Tutsukwa. The peaks serve as the home of the clouds, the home of the katsinas, and it really serves as a nexus for uh, moisture and rainfall, snowfall to come to the Hopi. Um, it's a sacred place, it's an ancestral place where there are many shrines and resources that the Hopi have taken advantage of for over a thousand years. Our traditions speak back to even its creation. of the San Francisco peaks lay Lava River Cave, a subterranean system of basaltic tunnels known as lava tubes. Nearly a mile long, the cave is open to the public year-round. What we like to do when we get to the end of the cave is turn off all our lights and see if we can see our hand in front of our face. Oops, I got turned mine off. Can you see it? No. Can you see it? No. I can't see it. About half a million years ago, this was a red hot lava flow going across the surface. The top part of it was cool enough to congeal into hard rock. But on the inside, red hot lava flowing down off the mountain, flowing through the cave and leaving this hollow. And this is just a tremendous place to look at the inside of Arizona. You know, people stumble into this cave and they're tripping on things everywhere they go and they don't realize that what they're looking at are original features from when this cave was active. Here's a place where a rock fell down off the roof, was incorporated in the wet lava and plowed its way through this soft rock just like it was a snow plow pushing snow off to either side. This is a very unusual place in this lava tube. At one time, the lava flow had split into two different active flows and created two separate lava tubes that then came together in this one spot. Despite hundreds of eruptions spread over the past six million years, our day-to-day -day routine can distract us into thinking Arizona's volcanic story has ended. Yet it was only about a thousand years ago when lava last spewed from under Arizona, creating Sunset Crater. 
sunset crater uh, erupted beginning through a series of months of shallow earthquakes that got stronger and stronger. Eventually steam started to rise out of the ground and eventually cinders were erupted from underneath Arizona and piled up in a large cone around this central vent. Eventually a lava flow came out from under the base of Sunset Crater and may have rafted away the first existence of that cinder cone, only later to have the cone we see today built on top of the very spot. Geologists have discovered that there was probably a five mile long curtain of fire where a vent that was long and linear are opened up and all of these volcanic materials were erupting up high into the air. And there were people living in the area at the time. My ancestors, my clan ancestors were actually in the area and then took the different signs of the um, eruptions that were about to occur. The boiling of the earth is what they call it. Um, the shaking of the earth. They called it uh, kualalata, titsqua kualalata, that the earth was boiling. And there had been some issues, social issues there with um, gambling and whatnot. So they took this as a real sign that they needed to reaffirm their social values, Hopi values. And so they actually migrated out of that area because of that. There's every reason to expect that you're going to get more volcanic eruptions up there. It's just that they might not only, you know, maybe they happen every thousand years or every couple of thousand years. We just happen to be in a period of quiescence, and many of us who are geologists in northern Arizona and probably throughout the state can only hope that we live long enough to see a small cinder cone eruption somewhere on the surface. There's a lot going on under there. I mean, I'm not a seismologist, but, but there are a lot of active faults that are not exposed to the surface. There's a lot of movement. We occasionally get, get earthquakes. And, and there's likely bodies of magma residing under there. And even deeper than that, there's a reason that we have magma under there, something that we still can't uh, quite understand. So, and it's, so it's, it's sort of active, shall I say. <laughs> We're probably not going to see it in our lifetime, but it'd be fun if we did. Now you'll hear more about the history and importance of volcanoes in our state from a senior geologist with the Arizona Geological Survey. Arizona Public Media student apprentice Anna Agostowska has an interview with Dr. John Spencer. We see remnants of volcanoes all over the state. How prevalent were volcanoes in the area in ancient times? Yeah, there, there have been several major periods of volcanic activity in Arizona's geologic history. The last one between about 15 and 30 million years ago was especially, um, delivered a huge amount of volcanic rock to the landscape and modified it enormously. Uh, in some ranges, such as the Chiricahuas and the Galliero Mountains, uh, the Superstition Mountains, are composed largely or almost entirely of volcanic rocks that were produced uh, at that time. Uh, in some cases, the, an entire range, such as much of the Superstition Mountains, uh, is produced by a single eruption that can last just a few hours, but it can deliver hundreds of cubic kilometers of ash, hot ash, that solidifies into rock. So that's that's major modification of the landscape due to volcanic activity. So what happened to those volcanoes? Aren't they, they are not active today. Right. When, when usually, or often when a big eruption like that happens, it's, it can mark the end of the life of a volcano, at least its, its, its ultimate phase. It it's, uh, you know, warms up, is a huge eruption, and then settles down, uh, and that's the end of it. Um, the, the, uh, what often happens though is you get a huge crater, it's called a caldera, where the land subsides into the earth as the magma uh, is erupted out of the earth and it leaves a space in which you get uh, a caldera forming. Crater Lake is the best known example, it's a, it's a volcano that basically collapsed into the magma chamber as the magma was erupted out from beneath it. Um, so how important were volcanoes in forming uh, the landscape as we, as we know today? The, the landscape is, since so much of the landscape is, is, consists of volcanic rocks, uh, they were quite important. Um, the, the volcanic landforms can be quite varied. Uh, you can get big stratovolcanoes, big tall volcanoes like Mount Shasta in California, or like San Francisco Peaks in Arizona. 
uh, or um, lava flows that flow long distances and just a wide variety of volcanic landforms. And it's, it's hard for a geologist to figure out exactly what a volcanic field looked like since they're now deeply eroded and faulted up. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's partly what geologists do, is try to figure out what the landscape looked like in the past. So do, do we have any evidence of what kind of evidence do we have of, of uh, volcanoes? Uh, other than the volcanic rocks themselves, it, with, uh, with younger rocks, especially like up around the San Francisco volcanic field near Flagstaff, uh, we still have the craters and the, the, the peaks that represent volcanoes. The San Francisco peaks themselves were once a volcano with a crater in the top, a small crater, but the northeast side of the, that crater is slipped away in a massive landslide, and so uh, you can't, it's not as obviously a volcano anymore uh, because half of it is slid away, but it basically, it's a young volcano. It just hasn't been active for a million years or so. Um, are, uh, what are the, mo the most striking um, volcanic features that one can visit today? Are there any? Right. Yeah, Sunset Crater up north of Flagstaff is, is it just, it's only about a thousand years old and you can still see the crater uh, where the volcano was erupting from within the crater, uh, a lot of spatter, lava that sort of gets blown out and accumulates in the, in the crater ring. Uh, the Native Americans were around when that happened. Uh, they know this partly because there's a little uh, building nearby that the Indians built, and they, they, somebody pushed corn cobs into the lava and left corn cob impressions uh, in the lava rock. Uh, and so uh, we know they were fooling around at the time. And uh, what is the potential now for, for, for a volcanic eruption in Arizona? Is there, is there, any, is there any? Yeah, that sunset crater would be the likely place for a renewed volcanic eruption. And we would have plenty of warning if it happened. There'd be a lot of uh, small earthquakes to signal the ascent of a, a new magma. Uh, also, um, it wouldn't be a, a really dangerous eruption, an explosive eruption. Most likely it would make more cinder cones like Sunset Crater, and it would be a great tourist attraction. So uh, I'm, I'm rooting for it. And um, we have about a minute left, and I have a question for you. Does um, Arizona Volcanic Pass somehow uh, contribute to the state's uh, gem and mineral wealth? Right. Any, any time that you have uh, igneous rocks, any time you have magmatism, and magma is ascending up into the upper part of the crust, uh, they, it triggers a circulation of hot water, uh, sometimes actually comes out of the magma, and those hot waters are often laden with the chemical elements that make up minerals. And so old volcanic fields are ideal for uh, finding minerals that um, might be attractive and might be even worth something. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's probably the single biggest process that produces the minerals that you see in the Gem and Mineral Show, is igneous activity and associated hydrothermal circulation. So is that why we have so many? Yes, it is. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's our show. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, you may visit our website at news.azpm.org. I'm Georgia Davis. Thanks for watching.